Shadwana Muhammad Rasulullah Shadwana Muhammad Rasulullah Hayyad Hayyad al-Sadeh Hayyad al-Faleh Hayyad al-Faleh Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah Hayyana Allahu Akbar. 
أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله وصل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم سبحان الله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه صلى الله عليه وسلم If a rain falls on on fertile land then gorgeous things will grow If a rain falls on putrid land nothing will grow you'll be left with with ugliness and swamps or nothing <laughs> if you're like me who washes their shoes and then leaves them out to dry and forgets them and rain falls then you will wake up and find that they are very wet which is what i woke up to today and what I'm thinking about. I laugh to myself because that's what, what I had been preparing yesterday. That thought was in my mind a lot. Um, the Quranic challenge is that it is a book. It is a clear book. But it is not an easy book. It is not a simple book. It is not a book that is something that you, you open and are given a black and white answer to because humanity is not black and white and existence is not black and white. Morality, ethics, are very layered by nature of existence. But human beings like to make things black and white. Rain can fall on something beautiful and make something beyond your imagination. Or rain can fall on something ugly and just multiply that ugliness. It's not just the Qur'an that this applies to. Human beings, I mean truthfully, it's, it's, it's not, uh, to, to me, my interpretation of it is that it is not the Qur'an. It's not actually a commentary on the Qur'an. It is a commentary on the nature of human beings. Because whether it is in an interpersonal arena or the political arena or whatever, Human beings love to take things, systems of belief, evidence, texts, whatever it be, and twist it to fill their needs and to bolster what they want to see happen. And Muslims do this with the Quran as well. This last month, I have thought a lot about what, what, do, what do we need right now? What, do, what can I offer that will be of help? Because it seems to me that the issue is a lack of power. It seems to me that the issue is a lack of influence whether we are looking at Philistine or looking at 
Sudan or looking at white supremacy or looking at Saudi Arabia or looking at any Muslim majority countries. Even if we had the correct belief, even if we had the correct solution, our power to carry it, carry it out is very limited. And it is my belief that power starts with accountability. I mean, really, I think it begins and ends with accountability because you only have power to change what you can control. And when I see, when I am inspired by the students who are doing what they are doing across the United States on college campuses, I feel like we failed them, my generation and the previous generation. If you did not listen to the last two khutbas, a lot of my, my thoughts are influenced by them. And so they are definitely worth going back and listening to, if you haven't. Because from a purely pragmatic standpoint, when I try to sit in the position of the administration of universities, who are not Muslim, I don't know what their beliefs are. But from my position as a Muslim, who is looking at them and believes that they should do what's right for the sake of what's right, yeah, that's, that's totally valid. However, I cannot ignore the extremely important relevance of the fact that for decades they have had Zionists and not just Zionists, other ethnic groups as well, pour money into their universities. Really, if I'm being honest with myself, if I was in their position, whose interest would I represent and whose interest would I defend? So when I say it begins with accountability, I am continuing the long tradition of having the Asuli Institute be a voice that is telling rich people to donate to universities, to create chairs. When I first thought about this, I, I had a voice in the back of my head saying, yeah, but you know, we shouldn't have to. Because, well, it's, it's the right thing. Why should I have to pour money into a university to sp stop or prevent genocide? And that's very true. That's correct. And I agree with that. So to go through this, to take you through and illustrate what I am thinking, I want to take you through Surah Araf. Surah Araf is a very long surah that has a lot of examples, a lot of different examples from, from different prophets. And I highly recommend going and listening to these, the tafsir on Project, you can find them on YouTube from Project Illumin yourself. Surah Araf is one surah that removed, not removed any doubt, but completely prevented any chance of doubt entering my mind that this book is a divinely revealed book. Because of the nuance that it deals with human beings 
and how human beings think and operate. One of the main examples that is in that book or in that surah is the it gives the, the it tells the story of Musa after the Exodus, and throughout the the different chapters of the Quran, um, we, we go over the story of Musa in many different times. And each time that you go through it, it focuses on different things. Sometimes it, it focuses on a different part of the story, you know, before Exodus, after Exodus. Sometimes it focuses on the same part, but it highlights different things. And as we learned in Project Illumin, it is of utmost importance that you pay attention to these differences because in that is the message of the surah, which is also why I believe that it is inaccurate or incomplete to cherry pick from the Quran because it is a comprehensive text and you need to know what the rest of the text is saying to understand one part of the text. In this telling of, of Musa salam's story. It is after Exodus and it is um, when he goes to commune with God. And it talks about how the people who are left over in another surah later learning that this was, this was a movement led by Samari that they returned to their old habits. They began worshipping the calf again. And when Musa comes down, he's livid. He's livid at the people who did nothing. And asks them, we, we just escaped this. And now I'm coming down and there's all this ingratitude and, and idol worship. And this telling of Musa's story focuses on those people who did nothing. And why did they do nothing? Well, you know, what, what can we do? They're, they're, they're doing what we're doing and the best that we could do was just not join them. <laughs> As you go on through the surah, in my understanding of it, is what Allah is telling you is that is not enough. It describes, the Quran describes people, compares people like this who are, you know, not doing what is right but not doing what is wrong they have correct belief and it is a this this surah is a message to the believers not just a message to to all people but specifically a message to the believers and it's talking to those who knew right from wrong and did nothing about it who take a position of neutrality in action even though in their hearts they might not be neutral that they, they actually recognize what is wrong and compares them to people on the final day who will be in between the fire and heaven almost as if they're stuck in limbo thus reaffirming and and um and and creating this 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 is very beautiful and, and intricate um, image that appears throughout the Qur'an that you are in complete control of what happens on the final day. What you create here is what you are going to find there. It is what your hands put forth. Musa alayhi salam was confronting a very challenging obstacle that I believe is the same obstacle that we are 
facing right now and have been facing for several generations, which is that we are a people whose parents have come from oppression, who grew up in authoritarianism, just like the just like uh, Musa's followers. And you find that there are two types. There are those who immediately resort back to the old ways. And it's very easy for them to find fervor in that. Samari had no problem finding uh, a lot of energy to do that. And the other one, when it comes to doing something different, they have a very difficult time getting themselves to stand up for what's right. They have become used to being pacifists. They have become used to keeping their head down, to not thinking creatively. It becomes very difficult for them to assert themselves and assert their power. And that is the same thing that I think, the same situation that we are in today. We raise children with the very small and limited goal of just go to school, just get an education, just get married and be happy, and pray and read Quran, and try not to upset anybody. It's the same situation. As much empathy as I have for this, because authoritarianism is an ugly, ugly thing, and I, I am blessed with a life where I do not have to worry if I open my mouth and say what I'm saying right now, that I'm going to be arrested tomorrow and, and disappear and worse. It takes generations to heal that. But we cannot be pacifists anymore. It is not enough to just recognize it. Because the message of Surah Araf to me is the necessity of intervention. It is not enough to just have correct belief. It is not enough to just hate something in my heart. That is the weakest form of faith. I can hear that and think to myself, well, it's a form of faith. Or I can hear that and focus on the word weakest. Just like I said in the beginning, human beings like to twist things to their own ends. So am I twisting this to better myself or am I twisting this to make myself feel better? So I encourage everyone to intervene. I encourage everyone first and foremost to take accountability and to understand their book. Because it is filled, filled Fourteen hundred years ago. I mean that that boggles my mind. That fourteen hundred years ago, a discourse like this was happening. And when I say a discourse like this, you know, those who know me know that my field is psychology. Because that understanding of, of human beings did not show up until recently. That understanding of human beings making excuses for themselves and not intervening is something 
that in, in the early 1900s and before them, between the 1600s and 1900s, Western psychologists and social, I mean, what would become social psychology, we're still arguing about the, the nature of a child and the nature of a human being, which is something that I'm going to get into in the second, the second khutbah. So alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, because we have this book that if someone understands it, if someone truly strives to understand it, it will better their life personally. And it can become the best friend, the greatest aid to bringing justice and establishing it on this earth. Ask her, your Lord for forgiveness. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم سبحان الله العلي العظيم والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه صلى الله عليه وسلم intervention when early European settlers um, came to the West Coast, came to California. And what, you know, now is we, we call Yosemite. Um, they saw tribes setting fire to the forest. And they, of course, thought these people are, are savages and backwards and are harming their environment and harming themselves. So in 1850, they established the Act for the Government and Protection of Indians. And I, I smile because of the protection of Indians part because that's usually how these, these things go is um, when they're controlling an indigenous tribe, they create an act that's labeled as if they are protecting them. And this outlawed the controlled burns. What, which now, I think we, we all know about the, the West Coast is, is infamous for their fires and the, for their wildfires. What took place and what took 100 years for, for a, U, United States ecologists to realize was that actually there might have been a reason for these controlled burns. Because what happened is the forest became so dense and grew out of control, which then suffocated smaller plant life, which then upset the, 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 the ecological balance of the area and made all plants more susceptible to parasites, which created more dead trees that are easy to catch fire. All of this grew, and if you actually, if you look at a picture of Yosemite, the earliest pictures is obviously not 1872, but around, around that time, you will notice how sparse it is. And if you look at a picture now, it is dense. You can't even see the, the before you could see the bottom of the floor, now you can't. And of course, when trees are all packed together very tightly, the, the wildfires spread. It is easy for other trees to catch fire. The indigenous population, without science and universities, because they lived off the land, knew how to take care of the land. And now, the people who come from the systems that we all have grown up looking up to with their universities, and their, their fancy disciplines of knowledge have begun establishing controlled burns to try and, and rectify the situation. What those tribes understood that we don't 
or that the United States didn't was the necessity of intervention, the necessity of stewardship. Another example. The leading thought on childhood morality for some time was from Thomas Hobbes. I'm sure a lot of us have, have heard that name before. And that was that children, like nature, are born vicious and born selfish. And that if it is not for the intervention of culture and societal restraints, they remain vicious and selfish. Then the pendulum swung to the other side with Rousseau, who said the exact opposite, essentially, which is that compassion rules. Children are born compassionate and loving. And it is only once they are attempt that once they're tempted, in other words, it is society that makes them not compassionate because their needs are not met or, you know, what, whatever it is. But it's the other way around. What now, and this is very recent by social psychologists um, in a meta-analysis by Karen Wynn, found that actually the truth is somewhere in the middle. And the reason why they say the truth is somewhere in the middle is because they're looking at one of the very famous studies that was done in social psychology that tested different ages, tested infants, tested people, you know, children at one, children at two, tested toddlers to see how they, their, their level of, they're trying to measure their level of altruism. And what they find is that children are amazingly altruistic. If they see, they have an inherent natural um, drive that if they see someone who's suffering, they'll go and they'll, they'll try to soothe them. If they see someone struggling and it's been modeled for them, they'll go and try to help them in the way that they saw without having to be taught at astonishingly young ages, even infants. What this, this new meta-analysis points out is that all of these measures were done between an infant and someone who was either their family or the same race as them. And that actually what you find from newer studies is that children do have an inherent nature to be altruistic, but they prefer people who are kind to them and they prefer people of their in-group. It goes on to state that this can only be changed, that what actually uh, alters someone's morality what, by our standards, improves someone's morality is the intervention of culture, is the intervention of what habits you model and create for these children. Thomas Hobbes, with his theory, um, created different levels of morality. And even with, with what I think is his flawed understanding of this, he created three different levels of morality in a human being. Preconceptual morality, conventional morality, and post-conceptual morality. So preconceptual morality is right and wrong is determined by prohibition and punishment. And you have an orientation towards self-interest, pain and pleasure. Conventional morality is following social norms, interpersonal agreement, and conformity. Law and order, authority and social order maintaining orientation. So you begin to understand 
it go, starts to go out. You start to see law and you start to see how people are acting and you usually will just do what the, what the group is doing. And then post-conceptual morality, social contract orientation and consciousness building and universal ethic, ethical principles for mutual respect. I don't know why he wrote mutual respect. I think universal ethical principles is enough. This is Thomas Hobbes. Fourteen hundred years ago, this was all said in the Quran. Not just said, but discoursed at such a level that I believe no human being could have written it. Thomas Hobbes, or sorry, not I keep saying Thomas Hobbes. It's not Hobbes. It's it's Kohlberg. Kohlberg. Um, said that most people, he believed that most people get to the second level, the conventional morality, but do not. In other words, your natural development as a human being will get you up to a certain point, but whether you develop morally beyond that depends on your culture and depends on your decisions, your agency as a human being. The Quran Surah Araf is written from a deep perspective of someone who, of, of an author that understands this about human beings and is trying to pull people to a larger ethical purpose. These two examples, the example of the, con of, of, uh, the national parks and controlled burdens and childhood morality are two examples that I believe illustrate why intervention is necessary in life. Why you cannot just sit by and let things progress. Why you have a responsibility to not just sit and be okay with your own prayer, with your own adhkar, with your, with your own zakat. This life requires that you understand the Qur'an and that you implement it. As Surah Araf goes on, and it starts pretty early on with, with these examples of pacifism and surrendering in terms of not doing anything. But what it illustrates is not that these people were really taking the path of least resistance. But actually, the truth underneath their actions or their inaction is that it's materialism. It is self-interest that keeps them from acting. Because when it comes to their, their own furthering, they're like dogs panting. And it gives that very profound and powerful image of dogs panting. Running from here, running to there. And they spend their whole life doing this. I constantly have to check myself. Because there are a million different fears within me that are driving what I am focusing on. To have a house, to be able to provide for my family, fame, recognition, respect. And from the moment I wake up to the moment I go to sleep, those are the thoughts that are threatening to preoccupy my mind unless I intervene. It is not enough to just pray five times a day. It is not enough to just give zakat. It is not enough to just engage in the rituals and once in my life go on hajj. And if that is all I do in my life, I believe that Allah will hold me accountable. 
because I don't know about you, but I want to be Allah with Allah on the final day, after the final day. I want to get to heaven. The other example, not the other, there's many other examples, but another example that is given in Araf is on the Sabbath. And I'll leave you with this to reflect on. That one of the criticisms of what the Jews did, and it's not about the Jews. Those examples are given, right? As a lesson of don't do this. Learn from this mistake. They were not supposed to fish on the Sabbath. But eventually change that religious law. And why did they change the religious law? Because of financial gain. I can imagine... that what was going through their head is, what's the big deal? Allah is, is very merciful. Allah is very kind. Allah will forgive. And besides, you know, I'm providing for my family. But the principle that is offered in this example is that they put financial gain ahead of religious law. And so going back to what I said at the beginning of the khutbah about we have failed these students who are standing for the right thing and risking suspension, risking their, their futures for the right thing because they refuse to allow the authorities to hold that over their head and to silence them. When we say to put our head down and to just focus on ourselves, all of that money that could have been going towards building power and influence in these institutions and controlling our, our, our narrative, where did it go instead? We might present this as doing the right thing, but it's not about doing the right thing. We might present that we keep our head down and we go to school and we go to work because we just want a peaceful life, but it's not. It's about financial security, which is a bottomless pit of needs because the more that you uh, the more money that you get the more that you should feel secure the less secure that you get and the more that you will fear of losing it allah is telling you to spend in allah's way and allow allah to protect you Put your trust in Allah, not in a bank account, not in a career. The narrative of Surah Araf is one that starts at the surface level of human psychology, which is that they believed right and did nothing, and takes you to the reality of the reason why you, why you believe correctly but did nothing is because there is a deep part of you that longs for material, that longs to cover yourselves in the adornments of security, that longs for the delusion of this life and pants for it like a dog. And that is the reality of what is underneath you. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees all. 
and has the ability, if you are lucky enough, to expose yourself to yourself. Because God willing that that happens in this life, because it will happen in the hereafter. And I don't know about you, but I much rather have that happen now than later. Allah forgive our sins. Allah guide us on the straight path. Allah help us to long for the experience of betterment more than we long for the experience of security. Allah help us to see what is the correct thing to do. Allah correct our desires, correct what we should want in this life to make it in line with what you want in this life. Allah help to open our hearts and soften our hearts. Allah help us to treat those who are of our out group, those who are not like us in flesh and color in gender, to be one of us, to be viewed as one of us, and help us realize that the path to you is in stewardship of your creation until the final day. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Akim as-salat.